Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> then I will begin. That's a, that's a cultural reference which nobody here will understand. <laughs> You're too young to even know. <laughs> Um, I'm Mike Byron, Manuela, and Fabiana, who you know. Um, we're going to go straight to mine. Uh, uh, we've got, we've got uh, a presentation uh, which tries to look at the relationship between what we've read and even more, like for me anyway, what I've heard this morning, just as a kind of preliminary. A lot of the words that I heard this morning, the discourse that I heard this morning, some of it overlapped directly. And then there were words like, and I made a note here, for example, disparity might be something where we would come across the word otherness more frequently. Um, but then at one point somebody, I can't remember who, talked about engaging with others. So that's also a phrase which we use an awful lot. Um, so I think the relationship between what we've, what we've heard so far and what you're about to hear um, will be pretty clear. Um, but we don't talk about interacting with flat earthers or neo Nazis, <laughs> particularly flat earthers. <laughs> we might talk about interacting with, flat, uh, with neo Nazis. But let's leave the neo Nazis on one side. On the other hand, we do talk about interacting with people of other cultures. The word culture, of course, as Raymond Williams said, is one of the most difficult words in English. Um, but if we, and of course, the, the word culture is often seen as synonymous with country, um, which is a bit unfortunate. Nonetheless, uh, others and other cultures and other social groups and interacting with them is kind of the background to what we are uh, presenting here. So we've got our outline there. We want to explain a little bit about our collaboration. I've got a couple of basic questions which lead us through the whole presentation, but how our collaboration came about, then into something a bit more substantial about what we mean by intercultural citizenship, and then the question of the relationship of that concept and the work in schools and universities around that concept. Um, using that concept might be a better phrase. Um, and then uh, each of us will take our turn in this, and certainly by that time I will have stopped, you'll be glad to hear, and we'll go on to the questions about the relationship between intercultural citizenship and uh, intellectual humility and interdisciplinarity and something about practice, although we may not come on to too much about practice, that might come in much more this afternoon. So those are our two questions. Can we find similarities and differences between these two concepts? Which, and we're looking for mutual enrichment. I'm already enriched from what I heard this morning because I, I can see that some of the discourse that I, that I have used, not these two people, I, they can't be blamed for what I have done, um, uh, was probably too simplistic. That's one enrichment which I've come across already. But anyway, we will see. And then we've got a second question, which is also number, got number one against it, I see. Um, as I said yesterday, whenever that happens, I blame Bill Gates. Um, but can we somehow use this enhancement, this enrichment and enhancement in our work as educationists with young people? Uh, young people, well, for me, everybody's young, but my, my young people, I mean, anybody from zero to, let's say, 25 and a bit, Clearly, all of this is important. Um, as I was just pointing out to Fabiana and Manuela, we've got a statement here about, in, from this morning's paper, uh, introductory paper about in contemporary society, arrogance is modeled at the highest levels of power. In contemporary society, there are many other issues which we, both uh, conceptual, intellectual, but also uh, sociological. In Europe, as you know, Putting aside the question of Brexit, I've only mentioned that once and will never mention it again today, but putting aside questions of European dissolution, 
um, Europe, the mobility of people, mass mobility of people within Europe is something which is a background to the notion of intercultural competence and in engaging with others. Um, but of course, mobility is an issue uh, in many parts of the world, not just in Europe. Um, we have worked together for longer than we care to say, um, but we've worked on projects in schools together. Um, sometimes I'm just on the other side of the ocean and uh, know about these things by Skype, etc. And uh, Manuel and Fabiana are the two people who really do all the hard work. Um, but we came across this notion of inter uh, intellectual ability and see some ways which might help us to be a bit more precise in the way that's the way we can it. Well, perhaps it's also, well, perhaps many people know, but Fabiana is, in one sense, one of Fabiana's many identities is a mathematician. Manuela has already said this morning that uh, one of her identities is an applied linguist. I think my identity, my basic identity, is a language teacher, teacher of what we call in, in Britain foreign languages or modern foreign languages. Uh, but I, I spent all, many years in a school of education, so I call myself an educationist sometimes. So the notion of interdisciplinarity, particularly among the three of us, is very important in presentation as well. So this concept of intercultural citizenship. Um, is my, in a sense, my responsibility. I have to take responsibility for this. What I did originally as a language teacher, it comes in a sense historically from my own experience as a language teacher, was to think that learning, and, learning a, a, a language will not be enough to help you to engage with others or communicate indeed with others. I'm certainly not engage in anything uh, more rich than mere communication or exchange of information. So, um, what we've tried, what I then tried to do in, in language teaching was say, we've got to teach other competences than linguistic competences. And you'll see those in a moment. Uh, what language teaching brings to intercultural citizenship is, to use a word, because the Intercultural, international, and cosmopolitan are all words which have some overlap, and all of them are have some disadvantages and advantages. But let's use the word international. That from language teaching, we bring into intercultural citizenship this international perspective. That language teaching takes you beyond out outwards. I often say that schools, in many respects, try to bring people within a national community in particular. Uh, and, the, and as a language teacher, you find yourself somehow a bit of an oddity in, uh, in, a, in a school in that you're trying to make people think about others, not to, and other communities and other countries and cultures and so on, and not just your own. So it's the international dimension which is important uh, in, from language teaching. Then from citizenship education, uh, the key words are action in our community and the phrase here and now. I'll now show you those two points a little bit in a bit more detail. I'm not sure how much, well, we, if you can't see here, you can see there. Um, those of you who can turn the back. This is a model of intercultural communicative competence. Now, a model is a simplification, or this use of the word model is a simplification. It's a, it's a presentation, it could be just a list, but it's a presentation of a different kind of the competences which I thought in 1997 and thereabouts um, were competences that a language teacher could teach, which are teachable, learnable, and accessible. But they're not all the competences of intercultural competence that's, uh, that one needs as an intercultural person, interacting with people from other cultural or social groups. But they, it's a model of what is teachable and learnable and indeed accessible um, in a language classroom. So it's a language classroom starting point. Across the top are linguistic competence, sociolinguistic competence, and discourse competence, which were taken from a previous perspective on language teaching. 
those are, if you like, the traditional notions, of the traditional ideas of what we teach in languages. We teach linguistic competence is a kind of synonym in the original for grammatical competence, knowing the forms of, of a language. Um, and sociolinguistic competence are the elements where of, of knowing how to use the language appropriately. I'm going over 20 years worth of development in three or four sentences here. Um, and this course competence is focusing much more upon the ability to shape your discourse, whether it's written or, 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 or spoken, but above all, written. Those are things which language teachers were already 20 or 30 years ago trying to teach. In addition to that, they're trying to introduce other competences, uh, starting on the left hand side, it says knowledge. You can ignore the French for the moment, or indeed for the rest of the day now. But knowledge, um, language teachers the last hundred or more years have thought that it's part of their job to teach information, or if you like, facts, to use a word, uh, about another country, and then they've called it another culture. That is, has, in this model, has been somewhat modified, but there's still a, a, a role or a place for, teach, for teaching, um, teaching, information or knowledge, that's a better word, about another social group. Uh, it can be a large social group, so group such as the French, um, but you can't say an awful lot about the French without immediately, without very soon, uh, finding yourself in deep water. But nonetheless, uh, information, knowledge, understanding is an element of what language teachers um, should, should be teaching in this model. Um, on the opposite side, we come across this word openness, <laughs> curiosity, <coughs> which are words which have come up this morning already quite a lot. Um, and I was glad to hear the word curiosity as a virtue. Um, and openness and open-mindedness are, are, is, a, I think, synonymous of this, in this model. Um, as attitudes. And this is where I begin to see that you know, when, I, when I was writing 20 or 30 years ago, uh, and perhaps ever since, I've been a little bit too cavalier with some of these words. But um, openness, curiosity, and then uh, skills of, uh, the top skills of interpreting, relating, that behind that notion is that when people want to understand uh, and interact with people of another social group, small or large, uh, then a lot of that involves interpreting documents in the widest sense of the word, relating those documents in the widest sense of the word to one's own, and uh, comparing and contrasting, and, and of course that's the way in which we learn anyway, to compare, contrast, and perhaps modify our existing concepts. At the bottom is the notion of skills of discovery and interaction, Again, still from the point of view of the language teacher, this, the emphasis here is upon the fact that um, in no way can any language teacher teach anything and everything about, say, the French or even a small subgroup of the French, Germans or whatever it may come to the language and country we're talking about. But therefore, it's important that learners acquire what, if you like, might be called ethnographic skills, the skills that a good ethnographer has when uh, finding out about another group of people. Whether it's another school that they've gone to, uh, also needs ethnographic skills. Somebody once said that we're all born ethnographers, just that we sometimes lose the skills. We often lose the skills, and what we're trying to do in language teaching is reinsert those skills. We, did, we once had a, pro a project, for example, called Language Learners as Ethnographers and uh, explicitly, as part of that project, taught our language learners were about to study abroad uh, the skills of ethnography and, 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 and So that's the emphasis upon those skills and attitudes and knowledge. And then right in the middle is this concept, this phrase, critical cultural awareness. Symbolically in the middle, in this representation, there are other representations uh, of, of how one can see these uh, these elements of intercultural communication. But, but symbolically, in this representation, critical cultural awareness is in the middle. The notion that when learners come across another 
person, group of person, people from, uh, who speak another language, uh, but of course will also need to be unpacked, but we'll leave it unpacked for the moment, speak another language and learn something about them, then one of their automatic, and I know this from being a teacher in a secondary school a long time ago, but nonetheless substantially important to me, they make evaluations. They react emotionally, and they make, uh, then on the basis of their emotional reactions, they make evaluations, they make judgments. Um, that's something that one has to accept as a teacher. As a teacher, the role would be to say, okay, that's the way you're thinking. What I want you to do now is to think much more carefully about why it is that you think in those ways. And the word conviction has come up today as well. And what are the underlying convictions that you may not be aware of, which are making you think in that way and, and come to, to make those judgments about others, the, those others, the French, the Germans, or whatever it may be. Um, so that was the, that's a model which uh, comes from language teaching. Then from intercultural citizen, uh, from, from uh, citizenship education, in the early, well, in the early 2000s in the UK and other parts of Europe, um, it was becoming very clear, or perhaps it was, should, have been become, should have become clear earlier, it was becoming very clear that young people were not participating in, in, in political processes from the simplest matter of, of um, voting that the number of people between 18 and 35 voting was falling very fast and schools as usual said you've got to solve this problem young people are becoming disinterested uh, uninterested in, in polit political processes uh, of which voting is a symbolic, uh, symbolic element. So citizenship education was as it were reinvented and I took um, this notion, uh, this, this definition of the aims of citizenship education from 2005 and that became part of this notion of intercultural citizenship. From that, in particular, these are the, again, <laughs> one, two and three, right, not one, one and three, but one, two and three. Um, I've highlighted number two, community involvement as being the main thing that we take into intercultural citizenship from citizenship education per se. But citizenship education, per se, usually involves becoming politically literate, to use the new phrase of the time, but becoming involved in the life of the nation. Whereas, from a perspective of language teaching, that's not enough. So, we want to go beyond, the, hence the word international, and internationalism in, my, in the previous slides, and in fact, but what is interesting in citizenship education is this emphasis upon community involvement in the here and now. And there's, in citizenship education, that is realized, that is brought into operation uh, and is even assessed. Um, but that's what we want to bring into intercultural citizenship from citizenship education. You've got the same kind of things in documents, or here is one document in it, anyway. Uh, because that was 2005, this is 2018, that was in the UK, this is in the USA, and this is just a statement from the Standards for Civic Education, uh, and I just highlighted the same kinds of processes, the same kinds of keywords of participation in political life, participatory skills, and the importance of that citizenship education should lead to improvement of some kind in society. So that that's just as important, that's contemporaneous and not just from 2005. So putting those two slides together, you've got intercultural citizenship as the kind of basic stuff. From which point, I don't spend too much time, we move on. All right. No, no, you didn't spend too much time. I think uh, we all we all learn a little bit more about intercultural citizenship when you present it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so having worked with Marlena and Mike on, on, on intercultural citizenship and how to bring it into the classrooms and for a few years, 
<laughs> uh, we came across the Humility and Commission Public Life Initiative here at UConn and found the definition and the idea of intellectual community. Um, and we were we were very keen to go look for more uh, about this theory and, and, and everything that it entails. Uh, we have heard this morning about this uh, part of what the definition that you can find online um, that is used by the project. I may, my, my hope can correct me here. But um, in just highlighting the words that came and jumped at us were this uh, idea of owning one's limitations as the definition and that being um, closely related to open-mindedness, responsive, being responsive to reasons, and also how this would help in public deliberation. So um, growing from there, we thought, let's look closer at what is out there um, about about intellectual community. So the question was, can we see what are the relationships between these two? And uh, not surprisingly, we found many things. Um, so from Garcia and King, uh, again, we are just highlighting the words which are familiar to us and very close to intercultural citizenship in the uh, self-understanding and mutual understanding intercultural conversations dialogue, uh, negotiating being a, a major, a big thing in intercultural citizenship, um, from Davis and Collins, and also in the treatment by Elder and Paul on critical thinking and intellectual humility for uh, actively distinguishing between what one knows and what one doesn't know, and still in their work when they uh, describe the outcomes of intellectual community or critical thinking, they have several items that they do have. A few of them we find closely related to how we talk and think about intercultural citizenship. For example, number two, the discovery aspect, which Mike is, uh, described before. But we also know something that are not explicit in intercultural citizenship, but they could be. And so, for example, uh, just take number five there, uh, articulate the extent of your ignorance. Not explicitly there, but it could be. So we saw many in our looking through all of these um, different works by scholars out there, we found many um, connection between the cultural citizenship and intellectual humility and potential for mutual enrichment. Um, some of our work was um, um, just recently up here uh, where you can find more details about that analysis that we did. And now we I want to, we are going to move into what we are currently doing. Um, and it's actually the looking closer at one particular work by our colleagues here who um, have described uh, what it is to have a limitations only view of intellectual human. And in comparing all those 19 identifiers that they put in this particular paper here, we were able to see again those connections that were clear and straightforward, starting from the very first one, admitting that the intellectual limitations, which goes hand in hand with the critical cultural awareness. But then if we move even closer into others, like number six, um, IH increases a person's concern about her own intellectual mistakes and weaknesses goes with what uh, in the model for intercultural citizenship we have about questioning your values and presupposition, seeking and taking up others' perspectives. But 
but so so here is an example where they go hand in hand. Here's an example where intellectual humility enhances. We could take it and enrich what we are doing and thinking because the idea of defeaters is not necessarily something that we explicitly were doing. But we think that is very much related to the part of interpreting and relating when you need to find and question yourself and think, what might make what I think force? Such an important thing and so much related to that. So I will now leave, uh, take, give it to Manuela to talk about another so here, um, here we have an example, hello everyone, um, an example where we feel that intercultural citizenship could actually really enhance intellectual humility um, because in intercultural citizenship we constantly are exposed to or expose our students to the other, right, to another culture. And, and that is, uh, we find a really good way because there are so many things involved in that, uh, not, not the least emotions in a way, how we really feel about something. So things that we might not question ever if we just see them as normal, we have to question if you're exposed to something that's quite different. And we, we see it again and again, and we also, in, in interaction with others, receive a lot of good reasons for that. So all of a sudden, we have to start questioning something. So here we feel um, it, it could go, the, the arrow could go, could go the other way. Um, but now, if I can, yeah. Now, to summarize what we've said, we just gave you a snapshot. We found more similarities, we found more aspects where intellectual humility could help us quite a bit in our projects. But to summarize, what we've found so far, and we are really, really like this, is that we feel that IH has a stronger emphasis on reasoning, on the meta level of reflection, um, on one's own, uh, one's own position and argument, which, which we th think can be very, very helpful in our work. Um, and intercultural citizenship, of course, we've used in a number of projects, and not only we, a lot of people all over the world have used it by now. And so it has been operationalized in, in uh, educational contexts. So now we move into um, and we don't think we need to explain it very much in this very interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary setting. Um, but the National Education Association, also in K through 12, and certainly in, in higher education, um, we feel we need to foster interdisciplinarity. We understand the importance. Here, it, the quote says, if today's students want to compete, compete is maybe one word we take some issue with. Uh, we would like to. Um, replace it with collaborate and problem solve, <laughs> cooperate maybe. <laughs> I'm not quite so. <laughs> but in this global society, they must be proficient communicators, creators, critical thinkers, and collaborators. Easy to do, right? <laughs> Students need to master additional subject areas, including languages that are even named here, the arts, geography, and so on. Educators must complement all of those subjects with the four C's. Um, to prepare young people for citizenship in the global work, workforce. And we, we really strongly believe, and we've been doing this in projects, that we need to collaborate and really integrate what our students do, so that they don't just say, we take a little bit from here, a little bit there. It needs to be a thoughtful, and uh, Mike often points out, a systematic approach to it. Oops. It happens easily, yeah? <laughs> okay. So we come back to the two questions. The first questions we touched upon a little bit just with the snapshot. The second question now is, can we use this analysis to enhance teaching? We don't have an answer, we have more questions. <laughs> but we are trying an answer. <laughs> so what we do through funding from the um, Community and Commission Public Life Project um, is um, we would like to integrate intercultural citizenship and intellectual humility in a project in two schools. One is a high school, one is a middle school. Um, we started working on the theoretical concepts and figuring out uh, the logistics um, in 2018. This is ongoing. This, a lot of the work is happening right now and will be happening very soon. And um, some of the products, just to give you an example of the topics that we are covering there in those um, interdisciplinary projects, Hurricane Maria, sports and leisure activities, 
um, immigration, health, so how, how are these activities different? How can we change our opinions? How can we change our judgments on some of these events? How they happen in our our environment, right? For example. So this is, um, we're, we're planning a comparison study where we, on the one hand, um, ask some teachers to implement an intercultural citizenship only or pure version of, of, the, of the project. Um, and that, of course, in itself, having listened to us, is, is a little bit of a challenge because there's so many aspects already of intellectual humility that we're covering. So we're struggling a little bit with this, and we're really happy about these conversations that we're having here. Um, but then there's another group that actually implements the intercultural citizenship project with a strong version and focus on intellectual humility aspects. And I don't know if we have time to give, we might have time to give the example actually. Um, yeah. So um, one example of an intercultural citizenship project, and we just compressed it really to take not too much time, is um, objectives could be that students work in the course of a unit as um, basically interpreters. They use their skills, their intercultural citizenship skills, and they use their mathematical concepts and calculations in order to design as facilitators, interpreter, interpreters, um, a product for um, recently um, uh, arrived immigrants. Um, to establish or to, to figure out all the necessities they need to establish a life here, right? And so, um, and then they design a portal to share and explain the resources they selected. Um, and they also created because they found that there are not all the resources there <laughs> that they need to support future efforts, right? So that would be actually in the community part of it. So the way this would look is a, just this intercultural citizenship project, for example, you could look at how the attitudes and um, opinions of the students have changed in the course of the project by doing a survey before. Um, so in, in one of the projects, we had a couple of iterations of this project in, in, in other contexts. Um, in one of these projects, the um, teacher decided to give a survey at the beginning that had um, some intercultural uh, citizenship um, components to it that we asked for where are the students approximately, but then also opinions such as when you come to the US, it's easy to make it if you just do enough, right? So it's easy for everyone to, to make it if you just do enough. And we noticed in that um, project alone that the students did revise some of their positions, actually, that they, that they noticed, ah, so certain things might not be so easy if you're an immigrant, depending on how much money you have available, depending on the language skills when you come to become, and so on, so many factors, right? Okay, so what we think, and we're just introducing one short activity that we think we could use, and that's just an example of one of the many things that we want to do. Many teachers know the KWL tables, right, where you say what you already know, what would you like to know, and then after the project, what did you learn, right? So we think we could do this for our intellectual humility group to really focus more on it, and I have to say I did some, some part of this, I did in my normal intercultural citizenship projects as well, um, but we want to focus here more on this. So what do you know about the transition of immigrants in our community first? What would you like to know? Right? Who, what, where, when, why, how, many questions, this would be more scaffolded as an activity. Um, then we add an S here, we said we really want to add the sources. What are your sources? How do you know that your information, that your facts are reliable, they're valid, right? How do you, how do you evaluate the information you come across? Do you incorporate different perspectives or only one? So that's important in that, in that part. Um, then, as a group, they would compare, so first with the individuals so that we have a baseline, basically. Then we would uh, have group work, they would compare their different knowledges, what they already knew, what their sources were, and so on. And then we would, um, that would actually cover, of course, um, seeking help of knowledgeable others. So we would foster that. Um, and then we would also ask, what did the other people know that you didn't know? So we would work with them more to really reflect on their knowledge and on their intellectual um, weaknesses and strengths in a way, right? Um, and how will, you, how will you go about learning um, what you need to know? 
for example. We could also imagine including a journal um, prompt. We would do several journal prompts uh, across the way. Um, and so, for example, that would be now look at the answers you provided to the in-class survey when they did it in the beginning and at the end they, they get it at the end and they, they look at how they change. Did you change your opinion on any questions? If so, why? Right, so often we do those activities and we don't reflect on it anymore. So here we would really focus on the meta level, on the reflection of how did my thinking about a certain topic change and why. And then we could go into some of these um, do you think it's, it's important? So those are really questions about intellectual humility. Do you think it's important um, to understand what you know and why you know it? To find reliable information, to seek help from others. So here we are really talking directly about those components, which is something that might not happen quite as much unless you come across somebody who used their source wrongly already. So, so here, here's just an example and, and a snapshot of what we think could be done. And this is it. I think we have enough time to check. I mean, a test of this would be to say to four of you in particular, but anybody else as well, particularly in these last few slides, do you recognize, <laughs> or can you guess, or uh, work out what are the what lies behind the questions that we're putting to the students, and does that align with your concept of limitation of Yeah, are, are we making jumps that are too big? Because sometimes, sometimes that's what we're worried about, right? Can you go back and just do at least one of those slides there for us? Sort of, that, that 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 one. One. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those. So I, I, I just popped up the paper with all the predictions. I was going to go through and see if there were more connections. Oh, there are actually. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, so we did a selection and we have them actually at the end of our presentation. We have several more. Um, and then we have So we just chose we chose one where it was immediate. Another one where I sit. So oh, here we had, to study. we had some more. Uh, we had some more of these that we that we basically took out because we didn't want to just say everything that we found, but really just give examples of some of the connections. Do you have this in a document that you can send to us so we can spend some time with it? Oh, hopefully so tomorrow. Oh, hopefully that's not work tomorrow. Oh, yes. Sorry. No, no, yes, no, that's fine. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we are happy to send it here to in the article. It's in the article? Yeah. 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 Do you have these matchings? The matchings we don't have in the article, but we're happy to provide them because we have a table where we actually have more explanations, where we have examples where we oh, integrated where we some projects and we found this, we found mm -hmm. the, the um, overlaps, and then ones where we feel, oh, here we could maybe emphasize a little more, so we have some color coding and we're happy to discuss <laughs> them. And actually, <laughs> for you to find thought with them. Yes. <laughs> I had a, I, I, in response to Michael's question to us uh, about these folks, but uh, you asked about, well, in the questions that we're asking the students, can you see, could we see what, can we backfill and sort of see what the, what the particular prediction is, yeah. right, your 19 things are they trying to get at? Could you, so go back to that last slide, it's one of the last slides, where the questions. I'm trying to press, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, about, oh. I think you're going to hear yeah, oh, right, right, the next, the next uh, or right, oh. that, uh, I think the very next, next one, yeah. Yeah, so this is an example of a journal reflection prompt. I realize that this is just an example. But I take it that, so, um, okay. So, so some of this might be, some of it, so some of it is about getting people to reflect on change in their opinions, and some is getting people to reflect on their limitations, right? But some, it seems like you might be trying, but I'm not quite sure whether, whether we can do it even more precisely to try to get the idea of defeaters, the idea yes. of defeaters, mm -hmm. yes. right? Yes, yes, yes. That there was something yes. that mm -hmm. made your, what is it that yes. made your belief That's exactly false? Yeah. Uh, I'm wonder, what I'm wondering is whether you could 
Well, it sort of depends on how old are the kids that were... So we do middle school projects and high school projects. But we, we also, for this project, for this specific one. Can you, and you change the questions for the two Yes, questions? absolutely. So they will, they will be fine-tuned to the, to the topic that they're doing. So we will give some examples, especially to middle school. We will give, this, so the question might not be that general, right? It might be a specific example so that the students can start thinking about it. Um, so working yeah. with the teachers also, because they know their populations much better to tell us that's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> they I, not I wonder what that in sixth grade. Or right, 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 right. Of course, yeah. of course, yeah. So, but I was wondering whether you could pull out that issue of defeaters yes. even more than you, you do. You would like I'm, to. I'm not sure what these, whether you guys would think that would be the most salient. I mean, a lot of stuff that they're trying to track here. But if given that's one of the things that's supposed to be, in your eyes, distinct, sort of additional, that intellectual humility mm -hmm. right. concept, is tracking that the overlapping concept of intercultural citizenship is doesn't have. Right, it's the thing that you know is not in the center of the, the Venn diagram. Um, it might be helpful to try to, to get at that more specifically, Absolutely. by perhaps going back to the way that these folks define it, and without using the word defeater, of course, mm -hmm. and that's the trick, right? To get <laughs> and without feeding them. The other problem is that's, that's without what feeding them. About, are, a, we, uh, are we forcing them to? Pretend to have yeah, yeah. intellectual that, that's well, a danger. But we could also take the pretending if it eventually. If, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And, 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 right. Yeah. and that's you know. one thing we discussed yesterday in a way that um, to some degree, if, if you're not explicit about certain things, you, yeah. you, might, you might see the behavior now, but the students won't be able to continue to reflect on it if they don't have the vocabulary about it even. So sometimes I feel that helping students reflect with the right vocabulary and, and telling what they can do so an intercultural citizenship for sure to know what it means to be interculturally competent and being able to um, tell somebody competently <laughs> is important or eloquently is important. Mm -hmm. And when I think we ought to give more chat or do two of them but we just had when I think when Manuela says vocabulary remember we're working in a foreign language. So it's vocabulary in that sense of knowing the, the words in the foreign language. Right. But at the same time, it's giving them the vocabulary. If, if all this were happening only in their, whatever we call it, first language, um, that would also be a matter of giving them vocabulary. Right. Yeah. right. So yeah. it's a double-edged exactly. phrase. Right. 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 Gotcha. And the concept, in a way, to talk about. Yeah. So maybe other people want to say something. Um, I was just going to say, when using intellectual jargon, I feel like a lot of times that can substitute the same words. Yes. So like if you use the slang and explain it to like the middle school and high school populations, they're gonna be able to understand it way faster than if you use the intellectual um, And then in that same respect, who's like presenting this idea to the kids? Is it like purely the educators or is it someone who like can relate to them on a cultural basis and like understand them outside of an academic setting, like a social setting, the way they can interact with people at home? Because like if it's only like their educators telling them these things, they might just go in one ear and out the other. But if it's someone who looks like them, acts like them, speaks like them, then the ideas will be retained like way faster. Wonderful. I think both comments are really, really important and I'd love to sit down or we would love to sit down with you to maybe with that jargon. <laughs> <laughs> with that slang. Um, that would be very cool. Um, but the, the second part that you're saying is, so right now we're working with teachers. Uh, we understand, I think, very well what you're, what you're saying, and that would be wonderful. Um, even working with teachers in terms of time limitations and their time limitations is already quite difficult. In another iteration of this project, it would be wonderful to have a, a social, uh, and other aspects going with it, I think, that, that would be really So one potential thing could be like asking students from whatever university you guys work at, I'm assuming at least some of you. All right, so, Ask students from here who were in school musicians to go back and help with the project. Like for example, I went to middle school, high school, and we started. Ah. So you know, <laughs> you're just not yourself a joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, we hope we don't regret your statement. <laughs> you know, I actually go back to my own high school and I help out with a lot of things. Oh, and back, you know, help them out like their senior projects and their thesis, training students and stuff like that. So 
you know, when you find students who are willing to go back, and once you get like the higher education point, I feel like a lot more students are willing to go back to be able to give students these answers. Yeah, because it's like, when your educator tells you this, it's just like, okay, yeah, you always say it's gonna get harder, and it never does. But like when a student comes back and says, it's gonna get harder, and this is why, you're gonna take it more literal. And then it's like in the same respect, if your educator's like, oh yeah, he wants to be culturally competent. <laughs> you might not always take it, but then someone who's like in a more similar shoe says that you're probably more. So, so just, just think, I mean, we only gave you a few examples. There's a lot more that will be happening in the classrooms. Of, of course, with the intercultural citizenship approach, the students are working on projects on their own, collaborating and working with the community. They are going out, they are going to their parents, they are going to other places there, investigating beyond their just the community about things in those countries or those other um, cultural groups. So it's not just them, and there is a com there will be some um, instances in which the teacher is not telling them you need to be intellectually humble. But what helped us right here and right now, or outside, to get the information? That Where are our limitations? So in those. Um, final projects where they actually post their, for the immigrants, help mm -hmm. and stuff, the, the acknowledgement, this is so, this is what we know, there might be more, and then uh, acknowledging that I don't know it all, we don't know it all, we went through this thing, but we don't, putting that there, are things that we are doing, that they are doing, that they are thinking, it's not the educator. In addition, actually, there is a component in one of the projects for sure, um, exchange students from Germany. High school students are visiting here, actually they're here over the course of three weeks and that's when we do the project. And that's the sports and leisure project. Where they really look into sports in general but also the role of sports and schools, the connection that sports and schools have here and not in other countries. And um, and they, they play sports together, but the other school members are and community members are involved and the parents to some degree. So there's going to be more interaction than just a school setting where we do a body unit and, and students are only. And, and in intercultural citizenship, we always try to, I say, break down the walls, and I think Mikey of the correct can say. <laughs> break through. <laughs> break through. <laughs> the walls. That, that's, that's something that we generally want to do. But I think that additional element of having somebody like them that they can relate to is so important, and that might not happen quite as much as it should. That's a wonderful addition. <laughs> Please be critical. We don't. Yes, yes. yes. We're waiting for. There you were wrong. <laughs> so, so it strikes. Looking at these, the questions. It strikes me that the second of these, um, it's a question about what they're valuing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so in that way, it, it seems connected to um, to what, what we think needs to be added to the trait of intellectual humility to turn it into a virtue. Oh. Right, because if they start, if they think it's important or they care about yes, yes. understanding what they know, if they if they care about for the right reasons, right, doing it for it, time. right, <laughs> that's right, that's right. They're doing it because they they care about mm -hmm. um, truth. They care, right? They right. If they're if they're motivated to do that because they want to. And, and they might have multiple motivations. Yes. They might be motivated to do it because they want truth, knowledge, and understanding. They might be motivated to do it um, because their teacher is telling them they have to. They might be motivated to do it because they want to improve the community. Right. 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 So um, they might have multiple motivations. But it seems to me that two is, is sort of pointing in that direction. Right. And, and hopefully also connected to the delight in learning, right? that we're hoping, that delight in valuing acquiring knowledge or learning something new and also in our case collaborating with others to do so. So I, I, I want to, <coughs> the reason I was thinking about these questions are related to, are related to uh, 
I'm wondering whether you might, I mean, what about the possibility of reflective questions that, in a sense, are less leading? So yeah. the problem I have with the question, too, is that it's, as you said, I mean, it sounds like I mean, most kids are going to know by the time they get to middle school and high school that they're supposed to say, well, of course it's important. <laughs> um, uh, so, so why not think about questions that are more like, uh, which do you think is better, uh, working hard to think, figure something out by yourself, or listening closely to what other people have to say? Now, maybe the right answer is that if it's a reflective question, the right, the, the best answer would be, well, both things are important, right? But it would be interesting to see how people might change their opinions to these sorts of reflection questions, depending because. You know, both are values. We, we think both things are valuable. Um, and that might, it might be more difficult to uh, interpret the results, but it might also be more telling. Uh, more uh, telling. Yeah. And, and, you know, in similar vein, you might think about, um, you know, whether uh, questions not just about um, knowledge strategies or things of that sort, but whether um, you know, questions that are open-ended in that sense and, and put and, and give them some pressure to go in either direction. Right. And right? And so this is just one example, but I, I think one thing that comes a little more closely that we have discussed among the four of us actually together, that comes a little bit more closely to what you're saying also are scenarios. Right? right. Where you give students scenarios and they need to make decisions and they need to explain a little more what they think about them. And I think those would be excellent also. And, and those scenarios could be mm -hmm. somewhat related, again, to the topic so that, that it's relevant and it's not out of the pool for the students, right? Um, does that, would that come more closely? No, I think yeah. that, that is, that yeah. is I tell you more closely. I'm just yeah. thinking that, you know, if, you, if these are things that you're trying to track the impact in a qualitative way of the, either concept, if cultural system, or intellectual humility in both of these cases, that it would, you know, just to sort of see whether people will continue to value, let's say, just working hard for themselves, um, or, you know, um, to what extent is, you know, questions about uh, the limits of their own culture, for example. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, these might be more difficult politically to, to ask. Those are very much part of uh, the but right. they are just, but yes. I imagine that these oh, that's what I was thinking oh, that this is the sort of things that Absolutely. you guys must oh, be yeah, working on all the time. Right. 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 But those same questions might get might be you know <coughs> this is why you guys are studying this might be used to track whether the person has become more yeah, yeah. Too, right? I mean, there's a sense in which some of the questions you may ordinarily ask may actually track intellectual humility as well as any of these questions here, depending on which of the 19, let's say, predictors you're, you're trying to latch on specifically. So, you know, and th those are questions that might be about how, to what extent you think your culture, put it bluntly, it's not a good question, but it's still an area, your culture has it all figured out with regard to <laughs> Without being aware, aware of it that you even sports. think that you think Yeah, about it. Yeah. 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 And, and that's it, that's one part in, in the cultural citizenship is targeted very 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 much, right? That you would um, bring to the to the surface what your values, beliefs are, and even understanding why you think so. And, and then there's there are emotions that are part of it, right? So if it comes to identity, yeah. certain things are part of our identity that we might not be so, so aware of, right? <laughs> So I think, um, going back to what uh, Heather was saying about knowing about the virtue, uh, about the why, right? like you could, I think you could uh, say a question too if you say why do you think is important. It yes. could be another way of saving it, right? Then you can really track the reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right now I say yes, no. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised by your question. Well, in one sense, I'm surprised um, by what you just said about it. it might be difficult, it might be politically difficult to ask. Well, I meant by that, not politically difficult in the sense that um, <clears throat> uh, what I, I meant that in a case in a classroom where you're, you might be constrained by 
what the school administration oh. wants you to get oh. into oh. and what you don't and whether you know for example parents might be calling you up and saying right. why are you why are you teaching this propaganda about immigration to my child <laughs> right or what have you uh, I, that's all i meant is that, well, this is something that you guys obviously have to deal with that right? never so, all the time <laughs> right where in wall street we don't usually have that problem <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, sometimes you do get that out well, of like, presumably like, you know, ask those questions of your students um, in your university level. Um, and uh, at the university level, you have freedom of expression and, and so on and so on, which does that not transfer to schools? That's uh, a rhetorical I, question. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, but, but, but in a way, so that's all I mean. in maybe, maybe a short, oh, sorry. Sorry, I mean, I think I understood that that's what you meant, but I'm still quite surprised. That it has to be said. I'm going to be blunt. Right, good. It wouldn't surprise me to hear that in China when I was three or four months ago. Right. It does surprise me to hear that here. Right. Yeah, it's here. Is it in the UK? Here. Is it in the UK as well? Oh, sorry, yes, I missed the beginning. Um, I would say broadly no. It's not. Um, teachers will say what they want to say. Of course, they're running the risk that parents will say something, but they're not any running any risk about administration. In my view, from the intercultural competence, work right here. Uh, yes, I, I mean I don't know. I mean Jason is the expert. I mean, you're an expert on U.S. education. So I mean my context, which I have most experiences represented. Right, that's true. And I, you know, I, I wasn't meaning to say that I, I was just acknowledging that certain of the questions I might want to ask, you know, straight out, uh, would even be questions that it could also be politically sensitive in another sense. That is, they, the, the the values, the political values that could, could, could and their salience to people could obscure the data that you, in other words, they could infect the data that you're actually interested in. So if you're trying to just track whether the person is owning their limitations or changing their mind, independently of their political values, right? And, and that's, the, that's actually... They could be focusing on political values and then not, and that could change how they're... But the, they answer the questions. The question, I think, is also, what do you consider political, right? Yeah. So in a classroom, from the critical <coughs> critical quote, Berg, which says, we're always political because we represent a certain view, whether right. we are aware of it or not, right? But that's not partisan political. And, and that's, I think, we emphasize that quite a bit when we work with students. Um, being political doesn't mean being partisan political, first of all. And the other notion of this is, I personally would not want to tell my students what opinions they should have. But I would, would want to make sure that they make judgments based on specific evidence, as we see in the model, right? Based on, on different perspectives. Um, that they can argue why they hold a certain belief, that they understand all the components that come into it. Um, they, they don't have to come out with, um, now I'm going to vote yes on question so and so, right? So, so that's not, but I, I would also want them to come out uh, and say, now I'm going to vote for sure. <laughs> so there's, there's, I, I think, and with that, I think we run into fewer problems. We still run into problems in certain districts. If you say this is aligned with social teaching for social justice, they don't want to hear a bit about it, right? Um, so one has to be: Do I still teach it? I might just not say it. I still don't. <laughs> I have to say, it. is that on camera? <laughs> well, in China it would be. Yes, it would be in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone, but. Yeah. Is everybody hungry? Or I think everybody's hungry. It's twelve thirty, which is probably. <laughs> I believe the food is getting delivered out there. Thank you.